Good afternoon. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes. Yes. So we'll go ahead and um, get started just so we can maximize our time together. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us together for our final session of the first Fridays with Fairbanks series. The first Fridays with Fairbanks series is made possible by the IU Alumni Association and the Richard M. Fairbanks School of Public Health Alumni Board. The Alumni Association has been hosting a monthly live Zoom event featuring a FSPH student and a faculty member from January to May. And each session will be recorded for individuals interested in the topic but unable to join us. I'm Melanie Shive. I'm a rising fourth year medical student and concurrent MPH student with a concentration in epidemiology here at Fairbanks. And I'll be speaking with Dr. Bill Tierney today, who's a clinical professor and associate dean of population health and health outcomes. So throughout this event, please be sure to use the chat function. We're hoping for a really robust conversation and we'll be referring to questions after Dr. Tierney's introductory comments. We'll be monitoring the questions and try to get to as many as possible. A few reminders about Zoom, make sure your microphones are turned off and we'll make sure to keep everyone muted except for those speaking and asking questions. We really appreciate your willingness to connect with us all virtually. So let's go ahead and get started. So our conversation today is entitled Seeking Mutual Benefit in Global and Population Health. And Dr. Tierney, um, our speaker today, his career has taken him all over the world to focus on global and population health research in Kenya, East Africa, Mexico, and the United States, both here in Indianapolis and also in Austin, Texas. So please welcome me um, or join me in welcoming Dr. Tierney. Thanks, Melanie. Um, I'm going to try to go through about 30 years of career pretty quickly, so kind of hold on to your hats a little bit. Hopefully, you can see the screen and see my cursor moving on it over here. Is that okay? Okay. So, um, let's get started. So, I started my career um, after being chief resident at, at Wishard Hospital. I started my career in 1980 on the faculty, and I spent half of my time practicing at Wishard as a primary care physician, an emergency room physician, and as a hospitalist. Um, the other half of my time I spent at the Reagan Street Institute, and it's better days. This is what it looked like. Um, and uh, um, I, there I worked with Clem McDonald to help develop and implement and assess electronic health record systems and health information exchanges. Um, and Wishon Hospital actually became a nidus for this kind of research for the country. At one point, about a quarter of all randomized controlled trials in health informatics had been done at Wishon and Regan Street. At the same time, my division of general internal medicine had established a, a collaboration. This began in 1990, a collaboration um, in East Africa with Kenya and, um, and in the western side of Kenya with El Loret, where, where its second national, second university and second national referral hospital were located. Uh, El Loret is here just on the, just west of the Great Rift Valley. And if you ever have a chance to drive across that, it's pretty neat. It's, it's terrifying and horrifying. It takes five hours and it's a terrible road, but at least back then it was, but it's, it's kind of neat to go through that area. Um, uh, this is the town of Eldoret. It has about 250,000 250, residents, although during the workday, there are more than 450,000 people who work there. So a lot of people come in from the countryside to work there. And if you see here, these little things are called matatus. And that's what there's the vans that people use to transport in and out from the countryside. Um, this looks like a bustling modern city, but in reality, like most places in the developing world, maintaining this structure is a challenge and things tend to fall apart pretty quickly. And so they, they, there's, there are a lot of challenges to, to both life and health and healthcare, et cetera. As I mentioned, uh, Moy Teaching Referral Hospital is a second national referral hospital. And in 1990, they launched a collaboration with I, the IU Kenya program where IU students would go and practice side by side with Kenyan students in, in, uh, in Eldoret and the surrounding communities. Um, at the same time, Kenyan students would come to Indiana, this picture of them in Chicago, where they would study with us. It was a bilateral exchange. Um, but 
Also, the, they got outside of Elder right into the countryside, usually as part of a program called CODES, Co Community Based Education Service, which is a combination of primary care and public health out in the community. And the nearest place is a, is a training center called Masoriat Health Center, which is about 20 kilometers from, from um, Eldoret, which is cinder block buildings with clinics where care was delivered, but also where COBS was, where public health interventions were launched for the surrounding community. About 18 years after I joined the faculty, um, I, and I wasn't involved with this at all, and I had no intention of becoming involved in this. Um, but about 18 years after I joined the faculty, the Fogarty International Center at NIH came out with a program announcement called International Training in Medical Informatics. Um, and since I had been the founding director of our N National Library of Medicine funded informatics research training program here at Regan Street in Indiana, um, the folks in the IU Kenya program asked me if I would apply for this because they wanted to enhance the care and the information for managing care in East Africa. So we applied for it and got it, and, and this is what they wanted to get rid of. This is at Masoriat, 30 years of medical records. Essentially, are ledgers with one line for each visit. They were used to generate the monthly reports from the Ministry of Health and then put away and never touched again. If you take these out, out of here, they literally crumble in your hand. Um, these were the four fellows who were trained in the program. I'm, I'm, I won't go into them now, but... But um, they all were successful after, at, you know, both before and after being in the program. We started by simply developing a, a simple paper encounter form that patients at Masoriat would walk, carry and walk through as they went through care. And people would write stuff, the, the providers would write stuff down on it. And at the end, a clerk would enter the stuff into a, a simple MS access medical record system that look like this. So this is a, a checking in a patient, actually the first patient in 2000 when the system was launched. And when we launched it, it was the first ambulatory electronic medical set record system in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and this is that day, and I was pretty goofy back then, but, but this is that day. And these, these, are, these are the records we're trying to replace with this system over here, with essentially this many people. Um, and it worked. So this is the first um, three years worth of, of visit data of, of some of the kinds of visits. It took a, a few months to get started, but then they saw between two and 3,000 patients a month. With You could see peaks during the malaria season. There wasn't much malaria in 2001. In 2002, 2003, there was pretty significant malaria. So this gives you an idea of, of how a system like this can track things that happen. We had a data dictionary that we, that we used these data to generate reports to the Ministry of Health. So th what previously took a, per a, a full-time person two weeks a month to generate, took, took one person five minutes to generate now. And not only could we generate reports, but, but the system documented what the charges were for the care that was provided and how much the patients pay for it. So they could, they could quantify the amount of undocumented, the un sorry, not undocumented, the uncompensated care that they delivered. And because of that, they appealed for more, they appealed for more funding from the Ministry of Health, and they got it because nobody else had this information. As a result, Masoret became the number one health center in the country. Um, and they were, they recognized that uh, in 2000 and I think two or three um, by making me an honorary elder of the Nandi tribe, which is the air, Nandi is the, is the tribal area in which the Masoriat Center was. And during that ceremony, I did some things that were pretty embarrassing we won't talk about. You shouldn't give mixed sticks. Um, but during all this time, um, that's not for us, let me see. During all this time, AIDS happened. Um, uh, this is the first great global pandemic. I shouldn't say the first one because the 2018 um, influenza, but the first one in a while, pandemic that was highly fatal. So this is the, and, and in the first 10 years of the, pan, the pandemic, two thirds or more of the cases were in Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? And they mostly attacked young people and it overwhelmed the health system. This is a real, real case. I mean, almost every bed in the hospital had two patients in it, back to back, head to foot. Um, and almost all of them died. And as a result, the number of Sorry, as a result, the number of deaths in Kenya, this is the number of deaths per year, went up to more than 100,000. This is equal to, there were about 30 some million, 31 or 32 million people in Kenya at the time. This is the equivalent to a million Americans dying every year. 
and they were mostly young people, people in their 20, you know, their, their teens to 30s. Um, and as a result, the life expectancy dropped over a period of 15 years, actually over a period of less than 10 years by, by more than five years in Kenya. So it was, it was devastating the country. And these people were the ones who were active within the economy too, so it was devastating the economy. Um, uh, so the IU Kenya program launched this thing initially called AMPATH, the academic model for, for prevention and treatment of HIV AIDS. Um, and the idea was to leverage the tripartite academic missions of service, teaching, and research, but to lead with care. Um, so that, but every place that they delivered care was a classroom for teaching and a laboratory for doing research. And, and why do research? Because no one knew how to deliver HIV AIDS care in the developing world. All of the protocols came from the United States and Western Europe, and they re relied on both medications and tests and ability to treat, et cetera, that just didn't exist in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we had to make it as we went along and study it. And to do that, we launched a research program, and I was asked to run both the informatics and the research program there. But to do that, we had to build local human capacity and infrastructure. We did, want to, did not want to create a system that was dependent on a bunch of Wazungu or white people to run it. We wanted to train the Kenyans to manage their own care and their own system. To do that, we needed buy-in from community leaders. We needed buy-in from pe people who were practicing in the clinical environments. And we had a buy-in from the community health workers who, who, these are traditional birth attendants, who are out working with the people whom we wanted to serve. So we took that, that cute little primary care information system and launched a thing called the AMPATH Medical Record System, which create, again used paper and counter forms because back then there weren't tablet computers and we didn't have good connectivity. So we relied on a, a medium that was cheap and easy to use and that was paper. Um, uh, clinicians would enter the information into the paper record at the point of care. And then we had a group of more than 20 data entry clerks who would take those data and enter them into the medical record, which was then used to deliver summaries of care that included patients' um, uh, problem lists, um, active medications, a flow sheet of recent uh, measurements, physical vital signs and tests, et cetera. Um, and then reminders to, to stimulate the you know, for, the, for example, this patient needed to have a CD4 count done because one had, was not on record with this patient. And that's a, a measure of the degree to which HIV AIDS is affecting their immune system. Eventually, we got rid of paper and went to a point of care tablet based system um, that's now in use initially in 23 sites in Kenya. So here's, oops, sorry. Got a very sensitive wheel here. Initially, 23 sites. This is Eldoret and Masoriat, the first place we launched clinics but in 23 sites throughout Western Kenya, and then um, um, uh, around 100 sites, and now, and, now more than, and now more than 500 sites in 17 counties in Western Kenya in which 24 million Kenyans live. So they're essentially responsible for the HIV AIDS care in, um, in those counties. Um, and over a period of time, this is, goes up through 2020, almost 300,000 patients with HIV AIDS are in treatment um, in this program. It's one of the largest HIV AIDS programs in the world. In addition, in 2007, they decided that this wasn't the only problem they had. And so they launched primary care and specialty disease clinics. And now more than a half a million other patients without HIV are being cared for in this network of clinics. Um, and, and it worked. So this is a man named Musa. He came in essentially dying of HIV AIDS. He was hypotensive and, and hypothermic and almost dead at this point. Then four months later, this is what he looked like when he left the hospital to go home. So same guy. Um, this is Francis when he, when he presented. This is Francis when he, when he was at three months later, and he became the director of the motor pool for AMPATH in Kenya. Again, to do this took a lot of people. And if you look in this picture, only two of them are Wazumbu. This is Frank Fries, who, who we, we uh, stole from Colombia, who helped train and, and um, provide input to people who manage the technical side of the program. And this is Paula Breitstein, who um, is an epidemiologist at, from the University of Toronto School, School of Public Health, and she manages the data management for, for Kenya. This, the, the information system that we developed um, was taken by uh, uh, investigators, uh, bioinformatics, uh, biomedical informatics investigators, the Regents Group Institute, this spread all over the world, initially in East Africa, but the rest of the world, including back in the United States. And this is our first 
really strong example of reciprocal innovation, where things developed in the developing world context are actually useful in this country. But now there are more than 60 sites and more than 6,000 different uh, practice sites and hospitals where the open MRS is being used. Um, but patients had other needs besides medical needs. Many of them came in starving to death. Most of them were subsistence farmers. And so we developed training farms with it, to uh, show them high productivity, organic, low resource techniques for increasing the yield of their farms. And they were sufficiently um, uh, successful that they, they, the farmers formed a collaborative and started selling their food back, not back to um, local restaurants and grocery stores and things like that. Um, we also helped the economic development launching, this is a clothing factory that we launched. To do all of this, we had to manage both the clinical and non-clinical care within this record system. So these were the encounter forms that we had for the um, initially on paper, and then uh, with point of care, but for the clinical programs, but also for nutrition, food distribution, social work, orphans and vulnerable children. Um, and then FPI is, is the economic development program. But then as we launched all these other clinics, tuberculosis, um, oncology, mental health, diabetes, et cetera, we had to develop, the system had to expand to accommodate you know, care and, and non-clinical programs of a wide variety. But then we, we kind of realized that you can't, you can't uh, defeat the HIV AIDS epidemic just by treating AIDS. Because as most of you know, people are asymptomatic for the first 10 years, up to 10 years that they're infected, but they're also contagious during that time. So by the time somebody's symptomatic, they probably already infected all the people they're going to infect. So if you want to be able to stop the, the pandemic, you have to be able to test people who are asymptomatic and start treating those who, um, who are, are not symptomatic yet. Unfortunately, because it's such a stigmatizing condition, people wouldn't come in to get tested. So we launched this program called Home-Based Counseling and Testing. And say we, I was you know, did a little of the informatics part of it, but the, the program launched this thing called home-based counseling and testing, where we went to the community, often on bicycles, um, our, the, the Kenyans who were, in, um, who were leading this program would go to people's um, homes and then collect data from them where they lived. And that would include a needs assessment um, and then perform an HIV test, a pregnancy test for women between the age of 13 and 50, a, a, a measure of the blood pressure and do a point of care glucose test. And if any of those things were positive, the patient got an immediate onsite referral to an HIV to, to one of the, the, the appropriate AMPATH clinics. Seven, seven years after launching this program, the millionth patient, the millionth person was interviewed. And by 2020, more than 2 million people had been interviewed. More than 98% of the people they approached allowed entrance to their homes and collection, a full collection of information. During that period of time, they identified more than 30,000 pregnant women who were referred to antenatal care and more than 50,000 patients who were undiagnosed, previously undiagnosed with HIV and AIDS and referred in for care and follow-up. Um, they also found that 20% of the, of the adults were hypertensive and 10% had, had an elevated blood sugar. And those people were referred for treatment as well. So the, this is not just IU, you know, other people have joined in this effort. There are now um, 14 different universities who are involved in this country, both in this country, but also in Toronto and in Linköping is in Sweden. Um, um, there are other, other universities who weren't part of the consortium were involved in the research program, both in the United States and in East Africa. Then in 2015, I left IU to go to, to, to Texas to help launch the Dell Medical School where we joined AMPATH both in Kenya, but also, um, with the help of IU, launched uh, a, an AMPATH program and just recently launched an AMPATH program in Puebla, Mexico um, with, a, with a, um, a partner university in Puebla. And then at the same time, NYU got funding from uh, both Lilly and another foundation um, to launch a program in, in Tamale, Ghana. Um, so and now uh, uh, is a, uh, in the very near future, uh, Mount Sinai in New York is going to bring um, a university at the University of, of uh, Kathmandu um, in Nepal into this, um, into this AMPATH Global Consortium. The research program that we launched in 2003, I'm sorry, in 2002, took us several years before we got our first grant because we had to establish all of the infrastructure to do research in Kenya, from the grants office to an IRB to um, 
to a project management office, to a, a reference laboratory, uh, research assistants to enroll patient, patients into studies at various sites and develop a practice-based research network, that all took time. But eventually we started getting some funding and, and, and now um, through 2021, more than $220 million of extramural funding has been brought in for research and training in, um, in AMPATH in Kenya. Um, these are the last 10 years between 13 and $21 million a year of funding um, and almost three quarters come from NIH. And about three quarters is focused on HIV and AIDS, maybe two thirds, three quarters, and the rest is focused on various aspects of care, including some specialty care, maternal and child health, malaria, et cetera. Um, uh, there have been more than a thousand publications now between 100 and 200 a year. And I'm, I'm happy to say over the last five to 10 years, half of the publications have Kenyan first authors. So how, what effect does this have? Well, this is when AMPATH started, you can see, it's not the only program in Africa, obviously, but other programs funded by the same presidential emergency plan for AIDS release, relief that George W. Bush launched was successful in blunting the curve in Africa more so than in the rest of the world. And in Kenya, you know, this is where our program started. And again, we're not the only one, but within, within eight years, um, the, uh, the, life, the number of deaths has gone down by a third. And I can happily say that if you carry this line out now, it would be below, below the 1990 rate of number of, of deaths per year for HIV AIDS in Kenya. And as a result, life expectancy has gone back up to more than 62 years. So it's been successful. So what, what did I learn in all of this? Well, what I learned is that you, you never ever know where you're gonna end up. That things are gonna come along that you don't anticipate. Um, and um, you must be prepared to jump to jump at them for the ones that that could take you places where you want it, where you might want to go. But to do that, you have to know yourself. You have to know what your interests and passions are. You have to know what you're good at, and just as importantly, what you're not good at, um, or what you might be good at doing. Um, you have to know what your constraints are, and you have to, and you and you have to know how big a risk taker you are, because risk and reward are highly positively correlated. The greater the risk, the greater the reward, but also the greater chance of failure. So you have to be able to embrace failure. Um, um, global partnerships last when both partners benefit. It's not charity. Both partners have to get something out of it, and and. What we learned was that the tripartite academic mission can be leveraged to improve health in low, res low resource countries, but lead with care and caring for those we serve, the rest will follow along. And with that, um, I will uh, shut this off and allow Melanie to lead uh, wherever the discussion might go and stop sharing. Excellent, thank you so much for sharing, you know, all of those experiences. I feel like we just went like in, like only 15, 20 minutes through 30 years, like, it, you know, at the drop of a hat. Um, That's what it feels like to me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so uh, I see we have um, an initial question in the chat. I'm definitely gonna keep um, monitoring that and bring up things as they come. Um, but for starters, I thought we could take um, kind of a step back and, and talk about like how you kind of started out you know, going into medicine, and then you kind of, you know, your career really took a, a change and focused more on population health, but still kind of with a focus on, you know, one-on-one -on -one mutually beneficial, you know, partnerships and developing those. So I guess, how did, how did that come to be? And I know you said things are kind of like very happenstance, but I guess if you could elaborate more on how that happened for you. Yeah, I, I, I tend to take advantage, you know, I, I, it wasn't due to a lot of strategic planning. I wanted to be a physician and, and my, my, you know, as I grew up, I just wanted to be a practicing uh, primary care physician. That's really all I cared about. Um, and actually through my residency, that's all I intended to do. And then um, I did the chief residency at Worcester because I really didn't feel ready to go out and practice yet. I wanted to, to learn more about health systems, et cetera. And during that period of time, I got, I kind of interested in academic medicine and, and thought I'd be um, a clinician teacher. And I was offered a position um, in the Division of General Internal Medicine. And I thought, okay, great. I, I can be a, a clinician teacher. And, and my role model for that was Gareth Gilkey, for those of you who may know him, but he's a, a, a long-standing primary care physician, the best physician I know, and, 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 and a terrific teacher. And that's 
That's who I wanted to focus on. But um, when I joined the division, the division chief, a guy named Joe Mamlin said, I can't get you promoted if you don't do research. And so, and so I had never thought of becoming a researcher. He said, go talk to Clem McDonald. You know, he needs, he needs help. And so I talked to Clem and Clem is developing this electronic medical record system. And it was huge. It had 35,000 patients in it. I thought that was huge at the time. I had no background in computer science, um, uh, no background in research, but what he was doing was seemed to be kind of cool. And I, and I, and I and just said, Joe, Joe wanted me to do it. I just did what Joe told me to do. And so I, I did a two year fellowship with Clem and then, and then became a junior faculty member with him and, and slowly took over the, the running of the, of the trials that Clem got funding for because he was one of the half dozen godfathers of the whole field of biomedical informatics. And from there, I just, you know, I, I saw an oper- I saw that, that, that informatics was just a tool to improve healthcare. So I started focusing, focusing on the health system within which informatics um, uh, uh, was, was a tool and, and the outcomes of that system and that got me into health services and outcomes research. Um, and, and we didn't really have a platform for that. So I, I got some resources and launched the Bayou Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research and, um, uh, you know, so it's, it's, and then the, the Kenya program thing came along and, the, and I jumped at that. So it's this, it's been not more tactical than strategic. It's, it's taking advantage of, uh, of opportunities coming along and, and just being lucky enough to be with, in a situation that, that we were able to be successful in launching. Got it. Um, so in the chat, um, Uze Kerbyik is asking, and sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, um, he's asking about comparing um, AMPATH with other projects going on in Africa and, and what have their um, impacts been over the years? The only, the only program that I would say is, is, is even bigger in scope, but equivalent in approach is Partners in Health. Which we've actually had some collaboration with. There was a, a, a informaticist and a partner, partners in health named Hamish Fraser, who was one of the developers of OpenMRS with Paul Biondich and, and Burke Mamlin at, at Regan Street, um, and Chris Sieberts from South Africa. Those were the, the four people who developed OpenMRS. So, so but but because of that, uh, partners in health were using this system, and we were able to see how they practice care, et cetera, and they have you know, a, a, even a bigger footprint than we have because they're in multiple countries, but they have the same kind of approach where you lead with care, you develop local uh, uh, resources rather than, than parachuting in and trying to solve people's problems for them. You, you, you create the capacity for people to solve their own problems. Um, uh, there are a lot of program and programs that don't last that long. I mean, Partners Health has been out there for 25 uh, years. AMP has been out there for approaching 40 years now. I mean, there aren't many that last that long because they usually are focused on, on the great white father coming in and trying to solve people's problems rather than saying, how can we develop a program that is mutually beneficial? Oftentimes the academic exchanges are medical tourism as opposed to work being like, for example, nobody of those 14 universities listed who were part of AMPATH, um, they can't be part of AMPATH unless they agree to take more university students back in their, in their home institutions um, because it has to be bilaterally symmetrical and not just students, but faculty, fellows, et cetera, uh, residents, you know, th- there are a number of ways that the, 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 the collaboration has to be bilateral, but everything has to be bilateral. Every research project has a, has a Kenyan and a non-Kenyan co-principal investigator. Um, uh, and, and we try to make sure that, that you know, half of that, that there's a sharing of the first and senior authorship on papers and things like that. So it, it's a mutually respectful, mutually um, beneficial relationship, even though it's, it's not equal. It can't be because the money is on our side and the need is on, is on their side. But it's as equitable as we can make it by having these strict rules about, about having um, counterpart relationships in everything that we do. For example, when I was the director of research, there was a director of research in Kenya, Winston Nyanduko, who's actually still in that role 20 years later. So there, there aren't many like this because it, it takes a lot of commitment to be able to manage something this long and, and also support. I mean, it, it, these things 
take a lot of energy and a lot of funding to um, to maintain. So it's sounding like the key to the sustainability has been that mutually beneficial aspect of the partnership. Um, and uh, and so strong leadership on both sides. I mean, leadership. between between Joan Mamlin and Bob Einhertz on this side, who led the program for for more than 30 years um, and um, and uh, multiple strong leaders and committed leaders on the Kenyan side. Um, that's the only thing that makes this thing happen is good leadership on both sides. Um, uh, everything follows from that. And I know your work is mostly focused on um, as far as with impact in the early time has focused on like HIV, but um, Virginia Keene is asking how have um, other infectious diseases improved like tuberculosis um, related yeah. to the HIV epidemic in the landscape of healthcare now. Yeah, there's a huge overlap between TB and, and HIV, as you might guess. Um, and there's a lot of TB there beforehand. And as you make these people immunodeficient, TB likes to explode in those people. So um, there are a lot of people who are co-infected. And that was actually one of the early problems is which do you treat first? If you treat the TB first, the HIV is still you know, will, will people respond to it if they don't have an immune system? If you treat the, the, HIV, the, the, the HIV first, you get this immune response uh, that, that causes massive inflammation in people's lungs and they end up drowning in inflammation fluid because you hadn't treated the TB. So we actually had to do a randomized controlled trial to see what you treat first. And it turns out is that you definitely treat the TB first. You don't treat the TB first as iris to immune, immune system inflammatory uh, immune response, inflammatory, whatever it is, but, um, is, uh, um, ends up being as deadly as HIV. Is. So um, it's, so that combination was very important. Hepatitis C coexists in a lot of patients. I mean, they don't have a lot of IV drug abuse, but they have a lot of other ways that about hepatitis C passes through the community. And so there's a lot of co-infection with hep C as well. There's a lot of co-infection with, with um, uh, HPV. So one of the, one of the more strongly um, uh, AIDS-related cancers, the cervical cancer, the first research assistant I hired, and to my, to, throughout my entire career, the best research assistant ever, I, I ever hired was Rachel Njiri in Kenya, and she died of cervical cancer. She, she, she was one of our patients. She had been uh, under treatment for HIV. I hired a research assistant. She was spectacular, and she ended up dying of, of cervical cancer because of um, the combination of, of HPV and HIV. So, so there are a lot of other infectious diseases that, that coexist that, that make this more difficult. Um, malaria is another problem, although in the this elevation is not quite so bad as the lower elevations around Mombasa on the east coast and Kasumu on Lake Victoria, but it's still a problem. Um, there doesn't seem to be much ex uh, exacerbation with the underlying um, HIV, but maybe because malaria more often infects younger people, children, so. So yeah, there are a lot of other infectious diseases, and and you can't not treat them um, because pay, as you as you create these these care systems, you're going to you know patients with with influenza and pneumonia I think that are also going to be coming in as well as the things that are endemic to sub-Saharan Africa. You talked a lot about like the unique like infectious disease kind of landscape of Kenya. Um, Jeff Richardson is now asking kind of about um, the program you've helped start in Mexico. Um, so like learning from your experiences in Kenya, like yeah. what's similar and what would you like to do differently or um, what else is going on with the Ghana program and how does that compare as far as the impact? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that, that's a really good question. So clearly the, the AMPATH was the, was the house that AIDS built, that three quarters of the, of the, of the 200 plus million dollars of research funding has been for HIV's care. There's been more than $300 million in clinical care provided by the Presidential Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And, and we use that platform to launch all these other subspecialty clinics without any additional funding. So, so obviously it's a house that AIDS built. AIDS isn't a big deal in, in Mexico. What's a big deal in Mexico is diabetes. Um, it's rampant in the countryside somewhere estimates were between 25 and 45% of people that have diabetes or pre-diabetes. More people in, in Puebla, in the state of Puebla, Mexico, where our medical school is, uh, that we're partnering with is, die from diabetic end-stage renal disease than all cancers put together. So it's, it's and, and it's the leading cause of loss of disability adjusted life years in, in, in Puebla, Mexico is, um, uh, is diabetes 
and vascular disease of which diabetes is the biggest risk factor. So um, our focus right now is gonna be on diabetes initially for care, but also for prevention. It's a, it's a preventable disease. Um, it's not easy to prevent because it takes changing people's lifestyles and but exercise and food and things like that. But, um, uh, and you need a primary care network. The other, the other in, in, in Kenya, there really wasn't a, a network for providing care for HIV. In, in Mexico, there's not a network providing primary care. Um, the uh, the government-run government clinics for people without private health insurance, which is about half of the people in the country, um, they have urgent visit centers that are predominantly run by 60 year medical students, um, but they don't have any longitudinal primary care. So one of our goals with, with our partner medical school is to launch a new, the, uh, in fact, people who go into primary care, urgent visit stuff, you know, most urgent visit center are people who come out of medical school and can't get into a subspecialty residency. So it's not a, primary care is not a career that people seek out. That's our goal. Is make primary care a career that people, there aren't any primary care training programs in Mexico. So our goal is, is to make, is to help help the, our BUAP, uh, Ben Emerita, um, Universidad Autonoma de Puebla, the, our medical school partner in, in Puebla, help them create a new specialty for Mexico um, and launch it in that state and show how we can, we can affect the, we can blunt the curve on uh, people uh, dying from or being disabled from uh, diabetes. So it's going to be the house of diabetes bill. And our, and it turns out that our partner is Lilly. Lilly, we have a three, $2.8 million grant from Lilly to launch this program in Africa and diabetes is what launched Lilly. So there's a partnership already there and they're already working with Mexico in the area of diabetes care. So, so we're going to hopefully um, leverage that relationship as well. That's really interesting to hear how, you know, in Kenya, the focus was more so on AIDS at the very onset of AMPATH. And now for these new partnerships, it's very clear that diabetes is like the central concern um, on the ground. Um, and so Lucy's asked, Lucy Brown is asking um, that, you know, about this um, expansion to Mexico and Ghana and like what, what drove the decision to go to those specific countries and, and placement sites? And then what would opportunities for students look like down the line um, in those countries and places? Well, the, um, I, I can tell you more specifically about Mexico because that program was launched, but I was the um, one of the founding department chairs in the new medical school, Dell Medical School, the University of Texas. And, and the dean wanted to have a global health program. One of the reasons he hired me is because of my background in global health. He said, we want to have a global health program. We know the students want this. We want this. We want it to be in, in Latin America. We don't want it to be in Africa. We want it to be in Latin America because for, there are more um, Latinos living in central Texas, the, the Austin and its surrounding four counties, um, than white people. It, we're, it essentially is a Latino city. So our partner ought to be in, in, in Central America. And I said, yes, we'll do that, but it's gonna take years to get that going. And we want medical students to be, to, to be able to participate as soon as possible. So we're gonna join Kenya first, but then while at the same time working in Mexico. And, uh, and the, there are uh, Dell Medical School students and faculty in um, Kenya as we speak, the first, the first group going there. We went on a tour of, 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 um, of medical schools in Central and South America looking for a partner. We went to Ecuador and, and El Salvador and, and Nicaragua, um, uh, Mexico, um, um, maybe that's it. I, I don't know all the places that we went, but um, we ended up um, deciding on BUAP because the dean was very, very hot to join us. It was about the right size. It's a much bigger medical school than IU. There are 2,500 medical students and IU is the biggest school in this country. And it has about, you know, 13 or 1,400. So it's about twice the size of IU School of Medicine. But um, it's, in a, it's, it's, it's in an area that's surrounded by a fairly well to city, surrounded, you get 30, 30 minutes outside the city and you're in an area that just looks like rural Kenya. Little, little villages of, Two to four hundred people who um, are um, uh, have have poor health and poor access to healthcare. So we so um, we end up choosing Mexico and Buapa as our partner 
after looking at a lot of other uh, possibilities in, in Central America. Um, um, and then at the same time, Lily was looking for, to launch a program, you know, came to uh, Adrian Gardner, where he was on the call, um, saying that they would, as part of the 30 by 30 program, they wanted to establish a program in Mexico. And, and he said, well, we, already have, we already have a medical school that's establishing a program in Mexico, let's support them. So that's how they helped us um, uh, be part of what's become Ampath Global. Um, I don't. I don't know exactly how NYU got involved with with Tamale um, uh, and uh, the the medical school in Tamale, Ghana. Um, uh, NYU, the the director of the Global Health Center at NYU, is somebody who had previously been a, a med medicine team leader in Ampath in Kenya and was doing research in Ampath in Kenya. Um, but but NYU also had a relation. An, a, an, Previously established relationship with them, with it's called UD, uh, UDS, um, University of Diagnostic Studies um, in Tamale, Ghana, and so NYU was leading the effort for Tamale, Ghana. Rachel Freeman, who who took over from um, uh, as the um, took over from the per person who took over from me as the director of research for Ampath Kenya, left IU to go to um, uh, Mount Sinai to develop a a um, Global Health Program, actually a department there at, at Mount Sinai. And they had a previous relationship with the medical school at, at University of Kathmandu in Nepal and, and a hospital, Dulakal Hospital in, 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 a, in Nepal. And so she's now establishing an AMPATH uh, global program in Nepal. So it's all these relationships that originally came from AMPATH Kenya. It, once they, you know, the diaspora, they go to other schools, they like the model and they're trying to replicate it. Um, and we anticipate others coming along as well. So like when you visited um, like the site in Mexico, I guess, what were your like initial impressions or like who did you initially talk to or like what, what made you think that it would end up being like a mutually beneficial relationship? Well, first of all, it wasn't up to me. I, I, I um, hired a, a former medicine team leader from, Ant, from IU Kenya um, named Tim Mercer to come and be the director of our global health program. And he's the one who established it. So I, and I don't micromanage. So he, he was undecided that's where we're going to do it and go forward. What I saw was first of all, great leadership. You know, their Dean who unfortunately a year later died of, of uh, cancer, but um, was very enthusiastic and committed to it. The school, uh, there were, there were leaders of, of, Teaching and research at the school were very interested um, in in and the and the, the approach to diabetes and primary care, et cetera, that that we were beginning to get excited about. Um, and then when we went out into the colonias, there was a need there, but there was also is a is a is a an infrastructure of of village health committees and, and small clinics, essentially a one room cinder block building that, the, that would kind of organize healthcare for these colonias that were underfunded, people were undertrained, but were there and wanted to learn how could we do more, how to do better. So, and then these, these regional clinics the, called Casa de Salud um, uh, that, that, that are manned by a nurse and a six year medical student, maybe a nursing student, um, are another really great opportunity to expand it, to, to, to help them with training, to put some more trainees there, to bring their trainees here. Um, and then there was a district hospital in a town called Abisco that was a beautiful new hospital serving these colonias that was being underutilized. So we just saw a, a, all these pieces in place kind of begging for us to, I shouldn't say begging, wrong word, a great opportunity for us to, to, to be able to get some traction early on. But again, a lot of it broke came down to leadership. Leadership at the different hospital was really excited, excited to the collaboration. Leadership in the in the it's called Secretary of the Salud, the, their Ministry of Health for the state of Puebla, um, is excited about getting involved with this, the university. So there all the pieces were seemed to be aligned. Wow, that's like a really awesome, you know, story of like, I don't know, coincidence or just things falling into place right when they needed well, to. Well, it's, it's actually about four years worth of work too. I mean, mm -hmm. this didn't, it doesn't happen spontaneously. These are highly entropy prone systems. It takes a lot of energy to get the stuff together, but it's not opposite pole, pushing opposite poles together. There are things that, that want to attract if they can find a, 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 
an avenue for doing so. And that's, that's what I think the empath model provides. Mm -hmm. And um, kind of going um, a little bit like also towards the presence um, related to like the <laughs> HIV AIDS information that you presented. Um, you had like mentioned that like the um, Denise um, Soltis is asking about um, the, the deaths and infection rates that you presented, like kind of, you talked about the projections, but you didn't uh, like, you didn't show them and- Yeah, um, and that's because you know I left the program in 2000. I left the program in 2010, I didn't okay. have the data. But um, I do know that the, that the mortality rate is, and, and Adrian, you can correct me if this, the mortality rate is under 2% a year. Um, and um, uh, uh, the, the maternal to child transmission rate, which untreated is between 20 and 40% a year is under 2% a year. Um, by treating mothers with antiretrovirals during pregnancy. Um, uh, so I, I know that those things are successful. I can't, I can't show you data for the entire country because I, I, I wasn't able to find it you know, with, with what limited time I had looking for it. But, but um, the, the trends are there um, within the areas that we're serving. I just, you know, hard to get pot. It's, it's not too hard to get data within our program, but then, you know, there are people in the community who are not in the program. You know, so who either don't know they have the disease, or they're they're they just don't want to be treated, or they whatever. Um, and so, um, getting population-based statistics on deaths, et cetera, a little bit harder to do. Um, and I I probably could do it. I just didn't have time to put it together for this presentation. Excellent. And kind of moving towards the future and in your like future directions, you know, with your current role with. Um, the Fairbanks School of Public Health. Um, I know one of the things you're like working on with your role is kind of improving relationships as far as between our School of Medicine and Public Health. I guess what directions would you like to see um, with with that um, in the near future? Yeah, well, you know, as I said, you know, the Ampath Kenya program was the house that, that AIDS built and they're getting now more into population health and looking at primary care and prevention and things like that. But it was predominantly a treatment program, lead with care, you know, because, because HIV AIDS, the caring for people with the infection was, was the focus. The focus in Mexico is gonna be much, much more from early on on prevention, you know, di diabetes prevention, et cetera. In Ampath Kenya, there's been minimal involvement with school of public health. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're small, they have a huge teaching role and, um, and a small number of faculty. And so they really haven't been able to get into research um, uh, and in population health improvement much, although they'd like to, they're just, they're just limited. And, and so I'm, I'm hoping that the Fairbanks School of Public Health can take the lead in, and I've already proposed this, can take the lead in Kenya in public health um, uh, practice and research. Um, and to be the lead institution for that. And, and then wherever that goes depends on how, how we as an institution carry it. Who, in the, who wants to lead? Who wants to be involved? Who are their counterparts we can identify on the other side? Because BUOP does not, as far as I can tell, does not have a school of public health. But there's a lot of public health in, in nursing. There's a lot in the school of medicine. So we'll, we need to find people with those interests and then develop partnerships to see what we can launch within the community. But that's my goal. I would love to see this school being the lead institution for, pub, for, for public health initiatives, um, and public and population health initiatives within the AMPATH Mexico program. Because there's, there is no school of public health at the University of Texas at Austin either. Um, and the Austin Regional Campus of the University of Texas Houston School of Public Health has not been much involved in global health. So I'm, I would like to see us take that role. And we've got a Department of Global Health. I think we're, we're um, uh, poised to do it to take advantage of that opportunity. And I've been having some deep conversations with Gerardo Mapome, the, the associate, uh, associate Dean for Research on how and uh, we might launch that. So if anybody's interested, you know, let, let me and Gerardo know because, because the, uh, um, this will be ramping up in the next six to 12 months. That sounds really exciting um, about like all these future directions. Um, I think as our final question, Jeff Richardson is asking um, about, uh, you talked about embracing failure. Um, and so in your experiences, what failures have you had and how did it help the AMPATH program grow or 
and or help you grow personally? Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> you know, when, when we first when we first developed the initial Missouri medical record system, it failed miserably. The first three months, it didn't work. And it didn't work because we tried to do the whole thing in one computer because we wanted to be cheap, right? We wanted to be as cheap as possible. So if you just do it with one computer with one person, then it'll work. And it turned out that it was just too much for one person to check people in and check people out and enter data from the encounter forms. It just didn't work. And so we went back three months later um, and we we put in a second computer. These, these are our desktop computers and we put a crossover cable between their, their serial ports and and we so they could both write to the same MS access database on, on one computer. We had opened up a separate window for check-in and check-out office, and that fixed that problem. So, and then for when we use the same platform using MS Access, um, which is nothing but a bunch of linked spreadsheets, right? So um, we um, launched the original Ampath Medical Records with that. It actually worked great. We're able to do you know, summary reports and computer reminders and reports and all, that worked great until it got to about 10,000 patients and 100,000 visit records when it died. It's just slowed way down because when you, when you, MS Access stores a record for every variable on those, on those sheets I showed you, even there was no, even when there's no information, because it's a spreadsheet, right? And so because of that, the database just got so damn large that reading and writing through it just wouldn't work anymore. So it utterly failed. And so that's when I called the registry folks in and said, we've proven we can do the electronic record stuff. We just don't, we can't do it in access and we don't have the ability to program in, in I know, JavaScript and MySQL and all the kind of stuff that you guys can do. So what do you think? And so they, they took it over. They created this new version of, Open, of, of the Ampath Medical Record System, which then was the platform that was turned into OpenMRS. But it had to fail twice to get there. Um, uh, uh, that's one. The other thing that failed in Kenya was the food program. So what, what initially what they did was they had a they had a couple of training farms where our patients, HIV AIDS patients, when they got better, could start working again. And they were subsistence farmers. If they wanted to, they they would go to work on these farms and learn these these um, these uh, uh, these special. I, it's hard for me to describe it a few words, but just ways of. You have minimal grazing, um, uh, certain how to raise certain crops, how to how to rig up uh, drip irrigation stuff with almost no cost, etc. Um, um, that that an NGO run by Steve and I'm blocking out last name from from Australia put up and and it was successful until it got so big that the business side of it couldn't manage it and it failed as as a business. But the other thing we realized is that people were coming dependent upon us for that. Food as well. So the best thing was to was to support their development of their individual little farms and not have these these four or five farms that Ampath was running that was producing food, not only for the people working on those, but for the Ampath program to distribute to its to its um, uh, to its patients. At, at, at its height, Ampath was feeding thirty thousand people a week, um, patients and their families. But then that program, what we realized was um, that people were depending on upon us for food. That's, that's, that's not sustainable. And so, and so that's when all these kind of economic development programs and micro loan programs, et cetera, were established so people could develop their own ability to buy food or grow food and not be dependent upon impact. So each one of those things failed to a certain extent to get us to a steady state now where people can generate their own income to be able to manage their own, uh, much of their own uh, social needs as possible. So it sounds like from those experiences, you know, failure is inevitable and it's more like your response in those situations that kind of drove to have, you know, the best possible outcomes in, in the case of the record system and the food program. Um, so it's, you know, I can't believe it's almost been an hour. Um, an hour well, here's really a, I want to talk about failure. Let me talk about failure yeah. a little bit is that, that you can't do this stuff and be afraid to fail. And that's hard for doctors. That's hard for physicians because we're trained, don't make any mistakes. If you make a mistake, somebody might die and it's on you. So with this big chagrin factor for failure for physicians, and it's really hard to get them beyond there and, 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 and embrace failure. But if a third of the stuff you do doesn't fail, you're not trying hard, trying hard enough. And the other thing I'll say is you learn a lot more from your failures than you do from your successes. 
If you think something's going to work and it works, what have you learned? You, you confirm something you kind of already knew. If you think something's going to work and it fails miserably and you figure out why it failed, you've learned a ton. So you, you, you have to embrace failure. You have to, if, again, if you're not failing, you're not trying. So, so um, I, I remember one of our uh, senior faculty went to Kenya for the first time and we were sitting there at breakfast after two or three days and he, he was shaking his head. He says, this stuff is just so risky. And I said, we eat risk for breakfast. <laughs> you can't do this without embracing the risk. I love that. Just having risk for breakfast. Yeah, well, um, thank you so much, everyone, for participating today. This concludes our discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Tierney, for all your dedication to improving global and population health over the years and in so many different capacities and developing these mutually beneficial partnerships and leadership all over the world. And this also concludes our first Friday series for this year as well. So thank you um, everyone for joining us and hope there'll be more of these in the future. <laughs>